So I'm going to not just talk about what's brand new, but also about uh, treating uh, MS, the condition itself, uh, in general, because there's been such a lot of progress uh, in the last uh, decade or two, as Gavin has mentioned. And I think, it, I think um, as well as discussing towards the end of the talk, some of the treatments that are about to become available on the NHS, I'll also discuss some of the treatments that have come available in the last decade and even in the last year uh, to try and give a whole, whole picture in 20 minutes, which isn't terribly easy. Um, so just to set the scene, MS has different courses, but essentially there are two main types. One is relapsing remitting, which is how MS usually starts for 90% of people uh, with episodes of symptoms that then get better, uh, either completely or partly, and things stay stable in between. And the second is a progressive type of MS where symptoms just gradually increase. Uh, and sometimes there's an overlap between the two. So it follows then that the aims of treating MS, that, that's the condition itself, not the symptoms, would be, first of all, to prevent relapses and the disability that they cause, secondly, to try and slow progressive MS, and thirdly, when there is a, a disability that hasn't gone away, to try and reverse it. So the current treatments are for the first thing. They are able to, to greater or lesser extent, prevent relapses and the disability that is associated with relapses, but as yet there are no effective treatments for uh, progressive uh, MS. However, it is a very uh, rapidly expanding area of research, including clinical trials, and we're going to hear a lot more about that uh, later on today. But I'm going to focus solely on relapsing remitting MS because that is where the current and emerging treatments are uh, available. And um, just before we get into the treatments, um, a word about doing clinical trials to try and show that a treatment really helps to prevent relapses. It's difficult. And one of the reasons is that the relapses are they're like the tip of the iceberg of the actual pathology that causes um, the relapsing uh, phase of MS. In other words, there's quite a lot going on that uh, doesn't cause symptoms. And this means that um, it is also a large and expensive task to do a trial to show that a treatment is better than no treatment. And that's normally done in a placebo-controlled trial. So half the people take a drug, active drug, half take a placebo. It's all blinded. No one knows, neither the patient nor the investigators know what the treatment is. And at the end of two years, one looks, and if there's a reduction in relapse rate, then you know you've got an effective uh, treatment if you compare the drug with placebo. Uh, the other thing is trials normally are of two years duration. It's very difficult to go on much longer than that. And so we don't really have a good idea of how effective these treatments are or how safe they are over, say, five years, ten years, even now, twenty years. So um, I want to mention another tool that's become very useful in relapsing and remitting MS in trials and also now in monitoring uh, people who are taking these treatments. And that is MRI scanning, because if one does monthly MRI scans, and this is only done in trials, you don't, one would do it much less frequently in, in practice, but if one does regular MRI scans, you'll find that there are 10 new lesions on the scan for every one clinical relapse. And this is the tip of the iceberg phenomenon, that there are a lot of inflammatory lesions occurring, but they don't cause symptoms because they're either too small or they're in a part of the brain that doesn't express symptoms. So this means that MRI then is useful because it gives a sensitive reader. And that's the way that new drugs are developed. There's a small trial that takes six months, sometimes even three months, with a, quite a small number of people. And that's enough to show that you can prevent new lesions in MRI. And one of the things that Dr. Sulmani, who um, Gavin mentioned, Dr. Sulmani is an extremely busy statistician from Genoa, one of the things she did is in this slide that she took 50 or more published trials where uh, a drug like betrinderferon, natalizumab, drugs I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, were compared with placebo and the beneficial effects they had on relapses, decreasing relapses, which is going in that direction, were very closely correlated with the decrease in new MRI lesions going in that direction. 
So in other words, the MRI in this situation is a good surrogate uh, marker of you know, the, the, whether a treatment is going to prevent relapses. So that's the sort of pipeline. Um, a new drug might be helpful for preventing relapses. You do a small trial with MRI scan, and then you do, you do still have to do a big trial to show that it prevents relapses and also that it's safe. Sometimes you only know when uh, a large number of people are treated about the safety. So the treatments that we have, and there are now, or there will shortly be, um, 10 available on the NHS. I think there are eight or nine at the moment. Um, what, the way they work is that they slow down or they interfere with the immune cells that are the, actually the cause of relapses and the cause of new inflammatory lesions. So we all have uh, immune cells, the, the white blood cells that are very important for protecting against infection. They're sitting in our bone marrow and our lymph nodes and they're circulating in the blood and they're constantly on the lookout to prevent infections of all sorts. But MS is one of a number of conditions in which some of these immune cells target the body's own tissues. So an MS that targets the myelin and it causes this inflammation, new lesions and then relapses. So the treatments are in two broad categories, two terms. One is immunomodulation and the other is immunosuppression. And essentially, there are a lot of molecular differences within those two broad terms. The specifics of the treatment are quite, can be strikingly different. However, immunomodulation means it's rather gentle. It sort of modulates the immune system. It doesn't really suppress it. And um, they tend to be less effective. Um, but also they tend to be, have fewer in the way of side effects. The more powerful treatments that really knock quite a big hole in the immune system in one way or another tend to be more effective, but then um, there may be a greater chance of having um, side effects. So that's a sort of a balancing um, decision that comes up in deciding which treatment is, is best. So these are the POTS hair treatments now. And first of all, beta interferons, of which there are four, and glaturum acetate, or also known as copaxone. These have been around for a long time, um, 15 years. So there's a lot of experience with these treatments, all given by injection. Uh, Tysabri has been available for about six years, and it's given once a month into a vein. And then um, in the last two years, the first oral pill licensed um, for MS is fingolimod gelenia. So, beta interferon, it's immunomodulating. Gentle end of spectrum, reduces relapse rate by 30% and reduces the number of new MRI lesions by 60%. And it has good long-term safety. There's now 15, 20 years of experience and it can have nuisance side effects but very rarely has serious side effects. So it seems to be a safe uh, treatment. Very similar uh, story with... Glaterum acetate or copaxone. Um, immunomodulation it probably alters the, the uh, immune cells that regulate their own function and it reduces relapse rate by 30%, maybe slightly less of an effect on MRI, 40% decrease there, but really essentially the same as beta interferon and again a very good safety record. Certainly there can be trouble with injection site reactions, they can be a real nuisance, but basically a safe treatment. So these two we know a lot about and but you know, when they first became available and licensed, the, uh, the body that decides whether such expensive, and they are quite expensive treatments, are available for the NHS is NICE. And NICE in 2002 said these treatments are not cost effective. Uh, and uh, that caused quite a furore at the time. And, uh, and, and there was a lot of unhappiness. It was the first time there was any treatment that could help MS. And so uh, a solution was found to make them available using these criteria for anyone who has two relapses in two years. It was called the Risk Sharing Scheme. And the Risk Sharing Scheme was a cooperation between the Department of Health, uh, the providers of the drugs, and also the MS Trust had a big, has had a big part to play in this, in monitoring 5,000 people yearly to see whether, in fact, their MS progression changed and whether it was cost effective. So it was a complicated model with economics and uh, finances and, and disability measures, a lot of people involved. But the really positive thing, and this was just announced um, uh, uh, last month, 
was that a six-year interim analysis, going to go on for 10 years, showed that these are cost-effective. And so this was uh, where the people taking these drugs were compared with a group actually from British Columbia who had not had any treatment, and there was a one-third slowing in the development of disability. That made them cost-effective. It's just what you'd expect. So that actually is good news, because I think that's helping to clear up uncertainty about long-term benefits. So then we move on to the next drug that came available, natalizumab or Tysabri. Um, it's been around since 2007. It's immunosuppressive, it, but in a rather quite a unique way. And what it does is it stops the immune cells going from the blood into the brain. It blocks the process of crossing uh, the lining of the blood vessels. Now it's, it's, it's at the potent end. It, 70% decrease in relapse rate, 90% decrease in new MRI lesions, and also reduces disability uh, developing by almost a half. It was recommended by NICE much more conservatively, so people have to have had two relapses in a year and also to have new lesions on the scan. And the reason that is applied is because there is uh, one serious risk attached to it that I'll uh, come on to. But this is um, how it works. On the left are the, the purple circles are the immune cells, the T lymphocytes, circulating in the blood. They have to get across this blood-brain barrier to cause the damage to myelin that causes the MS relapse. And what natalizumab does, it sort of glues them up. It stops them sticking onto the uh, capillary wall. Now, this was a completely new type of way of uh, treating any uh, condition, let alone MS. It has turned out to be pretty safe, and there's a small risk of an allergic reaction, about 2%, but otherwise safe except, unfortunately, for one uh, infection called PML. And this is an infection that occurs really only in people who are immunosuppressed. So this is a side effect of, um, of natalizumab. And PML, there is a way of trying to predict whether one is at risk or at, at small risk or uh, reasonably large risk. And the PML is due to a virus that half of us have. It's, um, so it's a very common virus, and our normal immune system just keeps it at bay. It just is tucked away somewhere in the bone marrow. It doesn't do any harm at all, called the JC virus. So you can do a test to see if you've had this viral infection. If you haven't, the risk of PML is negligible. It's really low. But if a person has had the infection, the risk is significant, but only after about two years of treatment. So that's the red sort of zone that after two years of treatment, antibody positive risk is more than one in 200. And if people have had a previous immunosuppressive treatment, it's actually more than 100. So that's the sort of information you can get that might help to decide, is this the right treatment to start? Should I change to another one after I've been on it for two years? So then uh, Fingolimod, the first tablet, um, and it... I would call it immunosuppressive. There is a grey zone between modulation and suppression, but I call this more suppressive. It, it, um, it again has a very novel action that it basically traps the immune cells in the lymph nodes so they don't get out into the blood or go into the brain. Uh, reduces relapse rate by a half, reduces new MRI lesions by about three quarters, and also disability, it has an effect there. And it's been recommended um, uh, now by NICE and starting to be used quite a bit. This shows how it works. So on the top is a lymph node, and coming in from the left are the blue lymphocytes, the immune cells, and they whiz across, and they interact with various receptors, and then they come out again, and that's part of the surveillance process, going into the lymph nodes and out into the blood and checking everything's all right. So you want, the way it's helpful in EMS is you, it stops the cells coming out. They sort of get st stuck in the lymph nodes. So the, it means when you do a blood Yes, there's a very low count of lymphocytes in the blood. Okay, so it has some side effects. Um, because it has this immunosuppressive effect, people are a bit more likely to be at risk of herpes infections such as shingles or chickenpox. If we do a check to see if a person has, has got immunity to chickenpox virus, and if not, you can have a vaccine to prevent any risk of that. The first dose... Everyone needs to have six hours of monitoring the heartbeat because there's a very small risk of a, causing a blockage to the, um, to the heartbeat. It doesn't seem to occur. It's only the, after the, only the first dose. And there are one or two th other things that are 
can be monitored and, and, and reversed if, if, as long as the one is regularly keeping an eye on things. There can be a problem with some swelling at the back of the eye that we can pick up on a scan after three months. The criteria for fingolimod is it's a second-line treatment. You can't use it straight out, first line. But if someone on beta interferon or on clitoramid is just having relapses, they can switch to fingolimod. Or if someone is in that high risk of PML in the red zone on natalizumab, they can switch to uh, fingolimod. And it is, it is being used uh, quite widely and being the first oral treatment, that's a big attraction too. Okay, so what's nearly there? Well, three drugs, teraflunamide, dimethylfumarate and alemtuzumab. The red underneath it is the trade name, which you, mm, often is the one used more often. So Obagio, Tecfidera and Lemtrada. I mean, these, it's a wonderful way these names are created and they have to be unique too, otherwise there's litigation between companies to say, hey, you poached my, my name. Anyway, um, uh, the first two are tablets uh, and uh, the last one, Alentuzumab, is given uh, as an intravenous injection for five days, daily for five days, but then nothing for a year and then another course. And that seems to be all that's needed for a very long time, certainly for, for many years. So teraflunamide, uh, NICE uh, approved it about three months ago, so it will just be starting. It takes about three months after NICE approval for things to become available in the NHS, sometimes a bit longer, actually. But it will be starting to be used, I'm sure, later this year. So it, it mod it's gentle. It's like beta interferon and uh, compaxone, 30% decrease relapse rate, similar sort of effect on MRI, and it's got the same recommendation uh, for treating MS, two relapses in two years, the same as for beta interferon and copaxone. Um, usually well tolerated, but some people can feel sick or have some diarrhea, occasionally some thinning of the hair. Um, one thing that must be avoided is pregnancy um, because uh, this is... One of, this has actually been shown in animals to, to cause um, congenital abnormalities, so, so it's a no-no for pregnancy. Now, um, dimethyl fumarate, again, it's immunomodulating, um, reduces the relapse rate by about 50%, uh, and new MRI lesions by 75%. It's undergoing a nice appraisal. In fact, there's been a preliminary uh, assessment that says it's not cost-effective, but that actually seems to be what often happens, and then over the next couple of months, there's a sort of various things happen and the equations and the models and it becomes, I dare say, the price and it becomes cost effective. So I think everyone's hoping it will become cost effective and likely to become available later this year. Um, side effects, flushing is common in the first few weeks and can be alleviated by taking aspirin, uh, some nausea, um, abdominal symptoms sometimes, and um, it doesn't seem to be associated with increased infection risk, but sometimes the white blood cell count is low, and that's something that will have to be monitored. And then alentuzumab. Um, so this is potent, immunosuppressive. This is something the United Kingdom has uh, had a particularly uh, leading part in developing. Um, our colleagues in Cambridge, um, Dr. Coles and Professor Compton, were the pioneers in studying this drug, when it was called Campath about 20 years ago, the very first trial, so it takes a long time for some uh, drugs to go through early testing and finally become available. Now, the, the trials of alemtuzumab uh, compared it with beta interferon, not with a placebo. Okay, so a little bit different. But what it showed was that there was a, about a 50% decrease in relapses, disability, new lesions, compared to beta interferon. So, of course, you have to bear in mind beta interferon has, on average, a 30% effect on relapses, so probably we're looking here at an 80% decrease in relapses. Very, very potent effect um, of this drug. It's just been recommended two weeks ago by NICE as an NHS treatment, and the recommendation is actually broad. It's for, it can include active relapse committing MS, which may only include one uh, relapse or activity uh, on an MRI scan. But, sting in the tail, more potent treatment, a bit more in the way of side effects. Um, and the main things, there is some increased risk of infection. Um, again, herpes virus infection can occur, but they can, of course, they can also be treated. 
Overactive thyroid is quite common. 20-30% of people in the trials have had overactivity of the thyroid, needing medical, uh, sometimes um, even um, surgical treatment. And um, uh, about 3% of people have had uh, internal bleeding because the, the clotting mechanism is affected, the platelets that cause clots uh, uh, are reduced. And so this means needing to have monthly blood tests to check for that change in the platelets. And very rarely there's another um, condition that affects the kidneys. The side effects seem to be, this is a very powerful drug that suppresses all the white cells, and then after a year or so they recover, but they recover in a slightly different way, and one of the side effects is that that actually creates some other autoimmune diseases, so the thyroid, the bleeding, and the kidneys are other types of um, autoimmune disease. So this is my effort to sort of put together the treatments in terms of the balance of increasing effectiveness and increasing risk. And one has the, the milder uh, effects of interferon, glutarima, teraflunamide, probably something intermediate for fingolimod and dimethylfumarate, and then the, the potent treatments, um, natalizumab, uh, alemtuzumab. But what you can see is also they're all different. I mean, the, the mechanism of the way they work is different, and the side effects are different as well. So I think you can make some conclusions. I mean, this has to be a good thing to have very soon 10 different treatments for on the NHS for people with relapsing MS. The benefits and the side effects vary. There's a general rule that the greater the benefit, the more the risks. But, you know, um, hopefully different treatments will benefit different people. And so we'll, there'll be more people who'll get good benefit with less side effect. I mean, that should be the case because one can, if one treatment gives side effects or doesn't give benefit, you can switch to another one. So I think that's, that's a very promising thing for the future. Uh, and hopefully, really, I believe we will be able to, it would be possible to control relapses um, in most people in the, in the years to come. Looking to the future, this is just relapsing emitting MS. Um, so there are more new treatments on the way. Uh, there are maybe half a dozen trials in various stages at the moment, uh, promising therapies again that all do something to the immune system. Um, interesting various approaches. Combination treatments is another possibility, putting together two drugs that may have a different action, but may together be more potent and yet may not have so much of side effects. It needs to be explored. There was a trial of... Uh, Copaxone and beta interferon done, which unfortunately it was a good idea, but unfortunately it didn't add benefit. But uh, you know, I'm sure there's promise in that regard. The other thing is uh, a move towards personalised treatment, so finding the right drug for each individual person. And there's a lot of research needed to understand who responds and who doesn't respond. A lot of a lot of molecular, genetic, pharmacogenomic research to try and understand that, and that'll be a big area of research in the next. A uh, few years. And lastly, we do need more long term data. So we know now, pretty much in the long term, that um, beta interferon and copaxone are safe, but we still don't quite have that picture because these other drugs have all been available for just a very short period of time, and MS is a, a, a long term condition. So that's really all I want to say, and um, very happy to have questions. Or, okay. Yeah.